In 1989, the University of Michigan chapter of the American Association of University Professors endorsed a statement requesting a significant gesture of reconciliation for three professors uh, who had been dismissed in the course of 1954. On November 19, 1990, the Senate Assembly established the University of Michigan's Davis Market Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. In doing so, the Senate Assembly noted that the faculty of the University of Michigan affirms that academic and intellectual freedom are fundamental values for a university and a free society. They form the foundation of the rights of free inquiry, free expression, and free dissent that are necessary for the life of the university. The faculty recognizes that such rights are human creations, the product of both the reasoned actions and deep-seated commitments of men and women. Now, when such actions and commitments are set in human institutions, people may secure for themselves and for others in the present and future, the enjoyment of those rights. This lecture, as your presence here this afternoon amply attests, rapidly became one of the significant moments on the intellectual calendar of the university. And in 1998, then Professor Bollinger announced uh, to the Senate Assembly uh, that his office would co-sponsor the Academic Freedom Lecture. Professors Nickerson and Markert passed away in 1998 and 1999. It is, however, a pleasure to acknowledge the presence of Professor Davis uh, here with us today. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce Peggy Hollingsworth, the chair of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, a past chair of the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, uh, whose extensive service to the university has been recognized through the Distinguished Faculty Governance Award, the Sour Goddard Power Award for women who have worked on behalf of other women in the university, and who has done important work uh, for the NIH and the NSF. She is also past president of Sigma Psi, the honor society for scientists and engineers. Dr. Hollingsworth has been a driving force behind the success of this distinguished series, and is also editor of Unfettered Expression, Freedom in American Intellectual Life. Thank you very much, Dr. Hollingsworth. On behalf of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, I would like to welcome you to the 18th Annual University of Michigan Davis Market Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. H. Chandler Davis is an Emeritus Professor of Mathematics from the University of Toronto, the surviving member of our three honorees after whom we named this lecture. He has once again joined us for the annual event. Chandler is not only a distinguished mathematician, but also a talented poet and essayist. And we've just welcomed you here, Chandler, so welcome again. We We are dedicating today's lecture to mathematics professor Wilfred Kaplan, who passed away on December 26, 2007, at the age of 92. Wilfred had a central role in the establishment of the annual lecture on academic and intellectual freedom, and served on the board of directors of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund from the day of its inception. He attended every annual lecture in the past 17 years and provided sage advice and generous donations to sustain the lecture series. Let us observe a moment of silence in memory of our friend, Wilfred Kaplan. Thank you. These are challenging times, not only for our nation's economy, but also for its colleges and universities. The assault on academic freedom to cherish by many in the professoriate continues unabated. The proportion of tenured and tenure track faculty at colleges and universities throughout the country continues to diminish, which has serious implications for the future of academic freedom. In addition, several rulings by federal courts, first in the case of Piggy versus Carl Sandburg College in the Seventh Circuit Court in 2006 
And now in the case of Hong versus Grant, which is currently on appeal in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, have stirred up great concern. These cases could redefine the meaning and significance of academic freedom. The first Davis Mark and Dickerson lecture, Robert M. O'Neill discussed these cases recently in a presentation at the University of Michigan. The Thomas Jefferson Center for the Protection of Free Expression, which Professor O'Neill heads, has filed an amicus brief in the cases of Hong versus Grant. While in Ann Arbor this past month, Professor O'Neill expressed the hope of many that the recent national elections will change the direction in which our federal courts have been moving in the past eight years. Shortly after the University of Michigan Senate Assembly established the annual lecture, the Senate Assembly created the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund. The fund is an independent tax-exempt organization that supports public lectures on academic freedom wherever they might be given. It relies on contributions from the public in order to continue to support such activities. In addition to contributions from individuals such as those here today, the fund since its creation has received financial support from a number of organizations. These include the Academic Freedom Fund of the American Association of University Professors, AAUP, the Professors Fund for Educational Issues, affiliated with the Michigan Conference of the AAUP, several departments and administrative offices of the University of Michigan, and public and private foundations. The fund has an advisory board comprised of distinguished scholars and leading authorities on First Amendment rights. Members of the fund's advisory board have a central role in maintaining and enhancing the quality of the annual lecture that goes beyond the raising of the necessary funds. They often suggest the names of scholars who will be selected to deliver and lecture, and some help to persuade an individual once selected to accept our invitation to give the lecture. A number of members of the advisory board are former lecturers. The primary source of funding for the annual lecture remains those members of our community who donate each year to the fund. Because of the current economic recession, the contributions that you make to support this lecture series today are more critical than at any time in the 18-year history of the lecture series. As the Faculty Senate's annual lecture has moved to fill a central role in the university's academic year, public interest in the lecture has grown immensely. For many years, the university's public television station, Channel 22, has rebroadcast this lecture repeatedly during the months that follow. Thus, your friends, colleagues, and students who are not here today will have opportunities to hear this important lecture by Professor Sunstein. Many are responsible for the success of this lecture. I would like to thank members of the Faculty Senate Office, its director, Thomas Schneider, and especially Linda Carr, for their efforts in assisting to organize this year's lecture. Patrick Murphy, Scott Mann, and their colleagues from Michigan Publication Productions are here again this year to record the lecture that we subsequently, subsequently will be able to see on Channel 22. For the seventh year, Brent Futrell has created an impressive poster to advertise a lecture. Arlene Simon, who is a PhD candidate in science and engineering, Paula Polowski, an undergraduate in French, Emily Haig, a first year law student, and Karen Teske, a master's degree uh, candidate in public health, have assisted by distributing the posters that you've seen across the campus. I am now delighted to introduce the dean of our law school, Evan Kamaker, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor today to be able to introduce to you Cass Sunstein, the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, uh, to be the 18th annual lecturer for this series. Your brochures contain a great deal of uh, detailed biographical information about Professor Sunstein's background and accomplishments, including his graduation with honors from Harvard Law School, his clerkship on the Supreme Court with Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall, his long-standing professorship at the University of Chicago Law School and his recent move to Harvard. But his impact on academic thought and constitutional practice radically transcends any listing of positions held, books and articles published, and awards and honors bestowed. Professor Sunstein is an internationally renowned public law scholar whose work has meaningfully influenced and even shaped the way lawyers, judges, and other scholars think about a significant number of issues, 
concerning our foundational legal principles and the underlying structures and processes of adjudication and decision making. His ideas concerning an astonishingly, astonishingly wide range of subjects from democracy to theories of regulation to judicial review to behavioral economics have been truly transformative for many years. Indeed, by virtually every plausible criteria, Cass is at least one of, if not the, leading academic legal scholar of our generation. In his new work on democracy and the internet, Professor Sunstein's ideas once again offer the potential to reorder our thinking about a topic of signal importance for our society. You are of course all by, by now well aware of the power of the internet to disseminate ideas, both for good or for ill. Uh, for those of you law students in the audience, you probably know that there have been some conversations recently about the way in which we have broadcast to the world our, our, our uh, you know, who's stealing whose sandwich from the refrigerator and uh, you know, who has failed to borrow or return whose cell phone. Um, I am very glad that today Professor Sunstein will be addressing even more momentous issues than that. <laughs> Uh, but they will be concerning internet usage and really the relationship between internet communications and the fundamentals of democracy and self-determination. On behalf of both the entire university and the law school, it is my great pleasure to welcome Cass Sunstein. Gosh, there are so many of you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm uh, grateful to so many. Uh, this honor uh, is humbling. Uh, Peggy Hollingsworth has treated me with such kindness and grace uh, during the scheduling and today. Uh, what you may not know is for the past few hours, uh, I've had the good fortune of uh, having intense visits with members of the University of Michigan faculty on a range of topics. And it reminds me of what I've known for decades, which is the University of Michigan has a unique place in education worldwide, and the way I'd characterize it is a combination of rigor with openness. Uh, this, uh, you can find rigor at other places, you can find openness, but the combination here is, is really unique, and it's not just an honor, but really a joy to be here uh, at this incredible institution. Um, uh, football team's also pretty good. <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have uh, three epigraphs for you. Uh, the first is from Google News. No one can read all the news that's published every day, so why not set up your page to show you the stories that best represent your interests? The second is from John Dewey. Majority rule, just as majority rule, is as foolish as its char critics charge it with being. But it never is merely majority rule. The important consideration is that opportunity be given ideas to speak and to become the possession of the multitude. The essential need is the improvement of the methods and constitution of debate, discussion, and persuasion. That is the problem of the public. The third and final epigraph is from Immanuel Kant, a passage that might be opposed directly to Google's celebration of personalized news. Kant wrote, one must take men as they are, they tell us, and not as the world's uninformed pedants or good-natured dreamers fancy that they ought to be. But as they are ought to read as we have made them. In this way, the prophecy of the supposedly clever statesman is fulfilled. Okay, I'm going to be approaching the topic of academic freedom in an unusual way. Standardly, that issue is uh, analyzed by exploring top-down censorship of the sort that's given rise to atrocities um, and tragedies all over the world. 
What I thought it might be worthwhile to do is to introduce um, a consideration that bears on academic freedom. That involves those forms of coercion and pressure, sometimes subtle, sometimes less so, in which each of us participates, sometimes inadvertently and un unwillingly. So the idea is to take academic freedom as a product of countless individual decisions that each of us makes in our capacities as students, teachers, friends, staff, engagers with others involved in the academic enterprise, and to suggest that the topic of freedom is for one for which each of us bears some responsibility, even if we're apparently relatively powerless. And I want to get at that conception of academic freedom, one which involves a collective enterprise, by exploring what Google is most excited about, that is personalization or customization. We can see this as a democratic achievement, Google clearly does, where we can personalize our system of news, create news that we like, in the sense that it appeals to our concerns and interests. Or we can think of it in terms of education, in particular, thinking of a personalized university as increasingly what technology and invention permits. MyUniversity.com is uh, coming to a town near you if you don't already live there. All right. Now, to approach that issue, that is the issue of personalization or customization, I want to tell you about three studies that I've been involved with in recent years and hope that you'll see the connection between the outcome of those experiments and academic freedom. First the experiments, then the connection. Not long ago, a couple of colleagues and I went to Colorado to try to create uh, some little experiments in democracy and education. We went to two places, Colorado Springs and Boulder. And if you know something about those two places, you know that Colorado Springs is mostly Republican and Boulder is overwhelmingly Democratic. We hoped that our Colorado Springs people would be conservative and we hoped that our Boulder people would be liberal. And we had a few screening questions before we let them participate in the experiment. We asked the people who were obtained by a public relations firm, uh, what do you think of Vice President Cheney? <laughs> <laughs> if the people in Colorado Springs didn't like him, they were cordially excused from the experiment. If the people in Boulder did like them, we asked them pleasantly to go home. <laughs> Uh, the way the experiment was conducted was very simple. People were asked to assemble into groups of five, and before they started talking, to write down privately and anonymously their views on three issues. First, should the United States sign an international agreement to control the emission of greenhouse gases? Second, should employers engage in race-conscious affirmative action pro policies? Third, should cholera recognize same-sex civil unions? After they registered their views anonymously on those issues, they were asked to deliberate, if they could, to a group verdict, and they all could, by the way. And after that, they were asked to, to state their views privately and anonymously yet again. What I was especially interested in was the effect of this form of personalization, people were sorted into groups of like-minded types, on their private anonymous statements of view. What would you expect would happen to the citizens of Colorado Springs after they talked for 15 minutes about the relevant issues? Well, two things happened. They tended to think the United States should not sign an international agreement to control greenhouse gases before they started to talk. The median member was doubtful. After they thought, talked, the median member believed anonymously that an international agreement to control greenhouse gases was a terrible idea. Our citizens of Boulder were mildly disposed to favor same-sex civil unions before they started to talk.
after they talked in their anonymous post-deliberation statements, they were very enthusiastic about same-sex civil unions. On all three issues, the deliberating groups ended up in more extreme points anonymously and privately from where they were before. The second thing that happened is that internal diversity was squelched. While people began with a degree of consensus on the Vice President of the United States, they began with a degree of disagreement on climate change, same-sex civil unions, and affirmative action. All of our groups had disagreement. As a result of a brief period of exchange of views, their private anonymous statements involved far less in the way of diversity. They basically all came into line with one another in their more extreme position. The third thing that happened involved what happened across the two populations. While there was a significant division between the median person in Boulder and the median person in Colorado Springs on the three issues before they started to talk, after our experiment was done, which, mind you, involved no mixing, only discussion about like-minded types, the division was much more dramatic. It was, in a way, as if the two groups occupied different political universes. That's the first experiment. The second involves the real world. The United States, for many decades, has been conducting a phenomenal and mostly unstudied natural experiment. On our courts of appeals, we have three judge panels, which can consist of three Republican appointees, Bush, Bush, Reagan, three Democratic appointees, Clinton, Clinton, Carter, two Republican appointees and one Democratic appointee, or two Democratic appointees and one Republican appointee. That's it. That's the total realm of possibility. A few years ago, I asked a research assistant to look at a bunch of labor law cases and to see how Republican appointees vote depending on whether they're sitting with two other Republican appointees on the three-judge panel, just one other Republican appointee on the three-judge panel, or by themselves isolated with two Democratic appointees. She looked at about 50 or 60 cases and something dramatic emerged. Those Republican appointees on three R panels, RRR panels, showed profoundly conservative voting patterns, far more so than when they were sitting with at least one Democratic appointee. Now, that's a little bit puzzling, because two Republican appointees on an RRD panel have a majority. Nonetheless, their voting patterns were far more ideological than when there's one Democratic appointee there. And if you do a mirror study involving Democratic appointees, it's exactly the same. They are far more ideological in their voting patterns in, RRR, in DDD panels than when there's at least one R there. Here's a statistic that'll show you what we've now found, having compiled nearly 40,000 judicial votes by glazed-eyed University of Chicago law students. <laughs> In cases involving gay rights, guess what percentage of the time a Republican appointee votes pro-gay rights on a three-Republican appointee panel? 14%. Guess what a percentage of the time a Democratic appointee votes pro-gay rights on a three-Democratic appointee panel? 100%. That's the most dramatic difference, but typically in cases involving disability discrimination, sex discrimination, environmental protection, on the DDD panel, it's about a 75% anti-corporate or pro-environmental group rate from the Democratic appointees. It's about a 25% anti-corporate or pro-environment vote from the Republican appointees on an RRR panel. If you're with me so far, the Republican appointees look a lot like Colorado Springs, and the Democratic appointees look a lot like Boulder in a natural experiment that doesn't have any experimenters. This is just the design of the federal judiciary. The third and final experiment is to me the most intriguing, and I confess I don't believe I yet understand it. What we did a few years ago was to get about 1,000 jury-eligible people in Texas, 
and asked them to rank corporate misconduct on a scale of zero to six, and also to come up with a proper dollar punishment for the misconduct. One case involved, for example, the manufacture of pajamas that turned out to be flammable and a kid was burned. People didn't like that very much. The median was around five. Another one, which to me was the most outrageous of all, and it should have been six on the scale, involved a failed baldness cure. <laughs> Americans are alarmingly not disturbed by a failed baldness <laughs> cure. So, so that came in around two on the scale of zero to six. People's moral judgments on the bounded scale we found were strikingly uniform in the sense that the median American, if you, if you assemble people into groups of six, what the median person on a groups of six does nicely predicts what other people will do on groups of six. So one group of six predicts well what another group of six will do. If you use the computer to create statistical juries in which the median member of the group of six represents the jury's verdict. A lot of regularity on the moral judgments. With dollars, we found things went haywire. A lot of unpredictability. If on the pajama case, one group comes in at a $500,000 award, the median member that is, another group might come in at a $2 million award. The jury is highly unpredictable with dollars. This study had a big problem. It didn't involve deliberating juries. It had nothing to do with the topic of how social interactions affect education or democracy. So we did what we thought was a follow-up footnote study, an expensive one to be sure. It involved 3,000 people, 500 deliberating juries. We wanted to have enough numbers to figure out that what we had done before, that is to take the median member's judgment as accurate of what a group would do. We had enough numbers to do that. Boy, were we surprised. In the pajama case, people came in at an individual level at a median of around five. The jury comes in at six. There's a systematic severity shift. Moral judgments, once they are outraged, end up more severe as a result of social interactions. In the baldness cure, cure case, people came in before they started talking at a two. In the end, the jury comes in at one. There's a leniency shift for low outrage cases. People who are disturbed get more disturbed. People who are lenient get more lenient. With dollars, and here's a puzzle, groups were systematically more severe than the median member. In fact, in over a quarter of our cases, the jury came in with an award that it was at least as severe as that of the highest individual member before they started to talk. Now, what links all of these studies involving citizens, juries, and judges? They're all studies of group polarization, which is a phenomenon uncovered in the 1970s, I think yet to receive adequate elaboration, which predicts that like-minded people engaged in deliberation with one another typically end up in a more extreme position in line with their pre-deliberation tendencies. If you get a group of people together who think that the United States can't be trusted, then their deliberations will lead them to think the United States certainly cannot be trusted. If you get a group of people who tend to think that an organization or a company or an institution is a good one, then after they talk with one another, they'll think it's an excellent one. This is a statistical regularity. It's been found in multiple places. The three studies I've given you are illustrations. What remains to be identified is the explanation. I'm going to try to do that in a moment. Let's bring this, if we might, into contact with um, a certain conception of the emerging marketplace of ideas and an ideal with respect to education and academic liberty itself. You can see in the domain of self-government or markets a very distinctive illustration of the happy vision of the trend in a recent book called The Long Tail by Chris Anderson, at one point the editor of the magazine Wired. What Anderson urges is that there's a long tail now of options with respect to books, CDs, 
opinions, everything under the sun. And this is terrific because it involves kind of a nicheification of, of commodities. That view was celebrated a bit more dramatically by technology specialist from MIT named Nicholas Negroponte, who suggested in 1995 that we're going to see eventually what he called the daily me, not the daily Nicholas Negroponte, the daily me in the sense of a newspaper by which you could design a communications universe of your own choosing filtering in and filtering out in terms of topics and points of view exactly as you saw fit. Pretty recently, I put the dailyme.com in a search engine, and there actually is one. It's a newspaper in Maine. <laughs> OK. Uh, the thought is that the proliferation of options at the university level and with respect to communications technologies generally, allows the creation of niches in a way that replicates our Colorado experiment and that helps explain difficulties of mutual misunderstanding that often infect not only the prospects for peace across nations, but also the, in fact, the possibility of productive conversations across citizens. To get a hold of this, Let's make a distinction between two kinds of architectures, two kinds of social architectures. You can see some institutions having and celebrating an architecture of control. Maybe that's the Google vision of search, where self-selection and sorting and uh, perfected search is the social architecture that maximizes con convenience and, on a certain view, freedom, yes? Milton Friedman, Chicago economist's conception of freedom, sees something like an architecture of control as definitional, really, of what freedom requires. And you can see that in the academic setting as well. There's a competing architecture. Let's call it the architecture of serendipity, which emphasizes the value, especially in light of the risk of group polarization that comes from self-sorting, of unanticipated, unchosen encounters with ideas and topics and points of view. The architecture of serendipity can have two faces. One involves the unintended, un unchosen encounter with a person, a topic, an argument. The other face of serendipity involves a certain level of shared experiences of the sort that the daily me is likely to exclude. So the notion is that a system of democratic liberty and maybe a system of academic freedom, too, depends as a kind, on a kind of foundation involving a certain set of shared experiences that unite people across difference. If we're going to talk about academic freedom in light of constitutional ideals, we might get at this kind of not that usual account of academic freedom through an odd and somewhat exotic constitutional doctrine which points to the kind of positive or affirmative side of the free speech principle. And by positive or affirmative, I don't mean to suggest good. I mean just to separate it from censorship or negative freedom, which is our standard view. The conventional view is that freedom of speech tells the government, stay away, hands off. And this is what academic freedom requires also. But there is a somewhat exotic constitutional doctrine that has a quite different form. And it responds to the fact that every tyrant knows that one way to diminish freedom is not merely by jailing dissenters, but by also closing off public spaces in which diverse people can congregate. The idea is that in a system of free expression, we have just not an, we don't merely have an anti-censorship principle. We also have a principle that requires spaces, which involves something like an architecture of serendipity. In the early part of the 20th century, the Supreme Court said that streets and parks have to be open for expressive activity, mind you, at taxpayer expense, insisting wherever the title of streets and parks may rest, they have immemorially been held in trust for the use of the public and time out of mind have been used for the purposes of assembly, communicating thought between citizens and discussing public questions. 
Such use of the streets and parks has from ancient times been a part of the privileges, rights, and liberties of citizens. What this means is that for democratic purposes, streets and parks have to be open for expressive activity so that if you go to the local store, you might encounter a dissenter or a malcontent who will bring to your attention a topic or a point of view in which you have no interest and which you might, if you were designing your daily me, have excised from your uh, field of vision. It's worth pausing over a question that the Supreme Court has never answered really, which is what are the social functions that the streets and parks, or the public forum doctrine as it's called, what's it serving? What's this doing? Let's notice, and there are educational analogs, three features. First, the right of use of the public street allows a dissenter or a malcontent access to an institution, whether private or public, with which it has a beef. A dissenting group is allowed to get close to, not at necessarily, but close to a company or a bureaucracy or a legislature, so long as the streets and parks are open, and that company or bureaucracy or legislature can't refuse to see the protester. The second thing the public forum doctrine does is to ensure that a dissenter or a malcontent has a right of access not just to the institution against which it's complaining, but also to a diverse and heterogeneous public which might prefer not to hear or see the complaint that the person has. So, so long as the streets and parks matter, and are open for expressive activity, any one of us, if we're disturbed about something, has access to lots of us. The third feature of the public forum doctrine, I think both for purposes of self-government and for purposes of understanding the social functions of education, is most important and subtle. The point here is that so long as the streets and parks are open, each of us has a kind of duty not a legally enforced duty, but a kind of practical duty to see people who are different from us, who may be irritating or worse, upsetting, jarring, and we can't really escape them as long as public forums exist. They'll catch our eyes. My suggestion is that this feature of the public forum doctrine and really the power of serendipitous encounters with diverse others, unavoidable, is a key part of what democratic freedom and even academic freedom entails. I'm going to come clean now and disclose that my inspiration for this isn't anything in constitutional law, not even quite in democratic theory, but is the work of Jane Jacobs, the great theorist of American cities, who in the death and life of the great American cities offers a tribute to the diversity, the teemingness of a city in a way that bears not just on cities but educational communities too. She urges the criticalness of public spaces in which visitors encounter people and practices that they could have barely imagined and could not possibly have anticipated in advance. I'm thinking a bit of my teenage daughter who's uh, about to apply to college who has some sense of what she wants to do, but boy does she have a lot of uh, surprise in store in terms of the sheer diversity of what's present. What Jacobs notes is that in a city, there's kind of pulsating, with, there's pulsation with life. It is possible to be on excellent sidewalk terms with people who are very different from oneself, and even as time passes on familiar public terms with them. Such relationships can and do endure for many years, for decades. The tolerance, the room for great differences among neighbors, differences that often go far deeper than differences in color, which are possible and normal in urban life, are possible and normal only when streets of great cities have built-in equipment allowing strangers to dwell in peace together. This is the architecture of serendipity, 
lowly, unpurposeful, and random as they may appear, sidewalk contacts are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life may grow. Now, streets and parks lacked in the latter part of the 20th century the same kind of salience that they had had in a former time. But if we think of the great institutions of the latter part of the 20th century, educational institutions, the t television networks, the daily newspaper, they performed all of the functions of the, of the public forums. In terms of getting people's access to a heterogeneous public. So long as there's a university there with a diverse group, you can do that. In terms of getting access to an institution against which you have a complaint, if the newspaper's doing its job, local or national, they're going to hear the complaint of enough people, at least if they're able to get access to someone, the local paper, the local network, or a larger, uh, a larger one. In terms of the duty to see, the legally unenforced duty to see heterogeneous types, think of what the experience of reading a daily newspaper where some story will catch your eye. See if this doesn't happen in the next week. It may involve an attack in India. It may involve an economic difficulty faced in Georgia. It might involve a group of people, suppose they're disabled, in some area of the United States who are encountering some new obstacle. That story you might never have placed in your daily me, and you may see the headline of the article with some boredom or dismay, but it may be that you'll read the first paragraph and the serendipitous encounter will affect you and maybe even Change, change your life. This is true not just for topics, but also points of view. Think of the number of occasions, and I hope it's more than one or two, on which a claim is made in an information source that you've encountered that seems troublesome or false or even evil, but it brings you up short and makes you think, and after the thought, you've changed your mind either a little or a lot. That's part of the architecture of serendipity. Okay, I hope it's clear that the architecture of serendipity as I've described it has two functions. First, it provides a kind of social glue to diverse people who are solidified together in a way by virtue of the information source which is shared. So too, it ensures that people will see diverse topics and points of view even if they've never, they, they haven't chosen them and they would never have put them on their, in their daily me. Compare this, if you would, with the emerging system both of education in many areas of the United States and the emerging system of self-government. The most vivid example is in the blogosphere where we have enough data to know now that many people of a particular political point of view flip back and forth from one blog that supports that point of view to another and back to another and another and another. In fact, one recent study of the blogosphere suggested that there's a lot of flipping by like-minded people to other like-minded sites, creating a kind of technological analog to the Colorado experiment, which is occurring every day. The same study finds that it is the case that some political blogs make references to the views of unlike-minded others. That does happen. But it also found that to a significant extent, those references are to the contemptuous and ridiculous and illogical nature of the arguments that those other sites are offering, not anything like, here's another point of view, let's have some kind of uh, dialogue. What we know is happening in fragmentation with respect to both topics and points of view is that like-minded people are sorting themselves into groups of like-minded types. Why might this matter? To get at this, let's talk just a little bit about conformity pressures and connect that to the ideal of academic freedom and the phenomenon of group polarization. The most vivid studies of conformity, and you might ask yourself how you think you'd do in this experiment, involved a simple test of visual perception, where people were given a line posted on a uh, piece of cardboard, 
and asked to decide how close that line is in length to one of, which of one other, one, which of three other lines on the blackboard most match the li line on cardboard in length. So it's a simple quest question of visual perception. On the first two rounds of the experiment, this is a very simple test, and people's eyesight works, and they get it right. In the third round, there's an unexpected disturbance. What happens is everyone else in the room makes a mistake. And the question is, what will you do? The reason everyone makes a else makes a mistake is this is not a study of visual perception. It's a study of conformity. And everyone else in the room is a friend of the experimenter except you. And you don't know that. Most people think the chance that they would yield to the unanimous views of others on, in an experiment of this kind is essentially zero. And yet 70% of people in at least one of a series of rounds do in fact yield. Now notice this is a very simple test which has a clearly correct answer. We expect the level of conformity to increase dramatically on a hard question where people don't have uh, clear intuitions. It might be a political question. It might be a question of ethics. There's a vivid illustration of the power of conformity pressures to pr promote yielding on a political issue on which people do have strong intuitions, and it bears directly on our topic here. When people are asked whether they agree with the following statement, free speech being a privilege, not a right, it is appropriate that the government censor it when national security demands, about 15% of Americans agree with that statement. 85% reject it. When people are confronted with the unanimous agreement of four or five others with that statement, about half of Americans will also agree with that statement. Okay, there's a puzzle here about why conformity pressures are so effective and leading people to yield even on moral and sensory judgments that are plain. The best explanation points to two factors. The first is a number of people in the conformity experiments said, with respect to lines, well, I saw it the other way, but I decided I must be wrong. If five or six other people made the mismatch, then I must have been temporarily confused. A number of other people said, I saw it the other way, but I didn't want to look like an idiot in front of strangers. <laughs> I yielded, not because I thought they were right, but because I didn't want to embarrass myself or them. Think how this bears on assertions of moral principle in cases in which the lack of moral principle conveys some information about what's right. If five or six other people think or say, let's go along with the crowd, others might too or the kind of intense peer pressure that might flow from their unanimous agreement. This doesn't explain, though, the three studies with which I began, the group polarization studies. They aren't conformity studies. They're studies in which people don't all agree with the majority. It's they end up in a more extreme position in line with the pre-deliberation tendency. And we know enough now to know this is a very robust finding. If you get a bunch of white people in a room who are inclined to show racial prejudice against African Americans, after they've talked together for a while, and I'm wondering whether the whites or the African Americans in the room will be more surprised by this, after the whites have talked for a while, they'll show more racial prejudice. The good news is, if you get whites together in a room who show a little racial prejudice, after they've talked to one another, prejudice drops, basically vanishes. If you get a group of people who tend to think that climate change is a serious problem in Colorado or anywhere else, as they talk to one another, they'll get more concerned. If you get a group of people who think climate change is a hoax and overrated and it's too expensive to be worth attending to, if they talk to one another, they will end up uh, less concerned about pro problem than they were before. What's going on here? Here are three explanations that seem to account for the phenomenon and to help explain why a system of uh, individuation or personalization creates real problems both for self-government and education. The first has to do with people's natural tentativeness in reaching closure 
on questions on which they don't have a lot of experience. If you ask people a question that's relatively difficult, people will, will be tentative, and they won't be extreme. But if they find their initial inclination corroborated by seemingly sane fellow human beings, they'll get more confident and they'll get more extreme as a result. In some of our Colorado studies, and I've seen the tapes, so too in the jury studies, you can see people initially unclear but leaning. And once the clarity is intensified by the corroboration, then they don't just lean, they run. The second point has to do with the exchange of information, not just with corroboration. This is about information exchange. In any group with an antecedent tendency, suppose you have a group of students who are inclined to be left of center on some issue. Call it, um, call it air pollution and the appropriate response to the air pollution problem. If you have a group of students who are talking about this and they are concerned, the number of arguments that support their concern will be large. That's where they're tending. The number of cautionary notes and, notes and doubts will be small. That's a minority view within the group. After the information is exchanged, they will have heard lots of arguments that support the concern, including some which didn't occur to them, and only a few new ones that undermine the concern. If they're listening to one another, they'll end up in a more extreme point in line with the position with which they began. There's a third point, though, that corroboration and information exchange don't quite capture. And I got a clue in talking about the jury experiments, as I did a few years ago, with a philosopher who works on the topic of animal rights. I told him about the jury study. And he said, here's how animal rights organizations are. When we meet on Friday of a three-day conference, we are extremely sensible by my lights, he said. By Sunday, he said, we've lost our minds. <laughs> by Sunday, he said, we start saying that no experiment on animals ever produced scientific knowledge that benefits human beings. By Sunday, we start saying it's never legitimate to eat meat, even if the animal lived an incredibly, indeed unnaturally long and healthy and happy life. <laughs> so we, we lose our perspective. And what he said is, these explanations about corroboration and information aren't adequate. What's actually happening here is that people who are inclined to be supportive of animal rights like thinking of themselves as a certain type of person and like presenting themselves as a certain type of person. Once they find themselves in a group of people with respect to whom they seem moderate and boring, <laughs> They shift a bit to hold on to their preferred self-presentation and self-conception. I've seen this personally in both the Federalist Society, the conservative group at American law schools, and the American Constitution Society, the liberal group at American law schools, where once group members get together, there's some shifting to the right and left respectively, which at least intuition suggests is driven by how people want to present themselves within the relevant group. There's a little piece of social science data that helps to support this speculation. And it's that when people find their initial view is corroborated by some stranger, they tend to rate the stranger as more competent and likable <laughs> than before. The kicker is, once people find their views corroborated by the, some stranger, they tend to rate themselves as more competent and likable than they did before. A double-barreled effect. Okay, the upshot for academic freedom and self-government, I hope, is clear. That is, insofar as personalized education, or the pressures each of us imposes on one another, each of us imposes on one another, it creates a kind of polarization machine, or an echo chamber, or replicates the Colorado experiment, then voluntary self-sorting of the sort celebrated by freedom's defenders creates a real problem. It impairs education in the literal sense, and it impairs education of the sort that democracy's citizens require. There's another problem which has to do with the point I made light reference to, which has to do with social glue. 
And here the idea is that the streets and parks in a long ago time and the broadcasters and daily newspapers in a more recent time did tend to tie people to, together just by virtue of the fact that sometimes information was shared and so too were concerns. Think, for example, of national holidays, which especially when they have substantive meaning, as Martin Luther King Day certainly does, and July 4th, newly perhaps after the 9-11 attack, has a kind of immediacy that it didn't have, at least not for everyone, uh, until after that attack. That uh, provides a range of values. It promotes helping behavior. It ensures a kind of mutual concern. It allows people to think of themselves as fellow citizens rather than strangers or opponents, something that can really matter when the chips are down. I have one finding, and if there's any finding you remember from the talk, I hope it's this one. It's not mine. It's a finding for which Amartya Sen, in part, won the Nobel Prize. And here's the finding that in no nation in the history of the world with democratic elections and a free press has there ever been a famine. It's worth pausing over that very puzzling finding that no nation with democratic elections and a free press has ever experienced a famine. How can this be? The answer is that a famine is in part a product of food scarcity but it's also a function of how governments respond to the prospect of food scarcity. And if food scarcity, and now we're talking about mass starvation, it's not about hunger, is on the way, democratic governments are under severe pressure, if the press is free, to do something by way of prevention. And it works. What Amartya Sen's finding about famine suggests is the importance of information's traveling from one person to another which becomes possible only to the extent that we aren't cabined into our own communications cocoons. We don't have daily me's. We have a kind of uh, permeable membrane by which information passes from one person to another. The problem in the United States that Hurricane Katrina posed was in part a kind of mirror image of the happy Sen finding, where while there was free speech and democratic elections, no doubt about it, the communication system didn't involve the kind of permeability which would ensure that everyone, including those who were unre unrealistically optimistic or skeptics or doubters, were informed of the stakes for their property or for their lives. Okay, uh, I'm nearly done. There's a question about what to do about the problems I've identified. On the educational side, the lesson is clearer, isn't it, for, than for purposes of self-government. For education, the idea is that it's very important for institutions that are concerned with freedom not only to ensure protection against censorship and punishment of dissidents, but also to make space both for serendipity and, for ensure, and, and to create norms to ensure against those forms of self-silencing which are natural products of voluntary self-sorting. So if it's the case that there are areas and classrooms and buildings in which one or another side looks like Colorado Springs did to the people in Boulder, there's a problem and the institution ought, at least through norms, to take corrective steps. If institutions are going in directions that allow tremendous self-storting of the sort that's possible at any great and large university, it's worth thinking about the difficulties in terms of, um, of, of, of not merely of learning, but of mutual understanding across persons that self-sorting creates. For self-government, there's uh, no simple recipe. I have just two little ideas, which is that the technology that we now have allows us to create public spaces of the sort that the parks and streets and newspapers and broadcasters never could be. And there's an un, uh, uh, unrealized possibility here, which is to create deliberative forums or domains in a way that would put to shame the kinds of public spaces that the Supreme Court celebrated at the early part of the 20th century.
The second little idea is the great importance of respectful links from one site or blog to another. We have far too little in the way of respectful linking behavior in a way that both can model a kind of civic tip of the hat to those who have different views and also lead people to read stuff that's different from what they've voluntarily chosen and that might change their minds or enlighten them. The more general point is that we'll lose sight of the difficulties posed by the current technologies and opportunities if we forget our aspirations, aspirations that involve education and self-government itself. I'm going to end with a little story and then a quotation from John Stuart Mill. The story is from, uh, it's a true story, from a political scientist named James Fishkin, who studies group behavior and who's assembled diverse people in a kind of mixing of the Colorado Springs and Boulder types to see what happens. He's tried to provide people with information to counteract some of the risks of the daily me by ensuring that heterogeneous types get together. Here's what happened a few years ago. He had a group of people down in Texas talking about welfare policy. In one group, there were four people, one of whom was a welfare mother from New York and the other of whom was a farmer from Oklahoma. The welfare mother was talking about the needs of her family to eat, have shelter, clothing, uh, and the inadequacy of certain proposals in fulfilling those familial needs. See, my family requires this. She had two children, a single mother. The Oklahoma farmer was getting increasingly heated as uh, she talked, and it was puzzling why he was getting angrier and angrier. But finally, he burst out saying, in the United States, a family involves a father, a mother, and at least one child. You do not have a father in the picture. Don't you dare speak in my presence about your family. You have no family. Needless to say, this little group was not the most congenial <laughs> for the next day and a half. And while they did deliberate, as the experiment required on various issues, the Oklahoma farmer and the New York mother were not looking at each other. It was a little like high schools in which tell John I said this rather than telling John this. Uh, it was icy, frozen. Uh, on Sunday as they got set to go, uh, the New York woman felt a tap on her shoulder, small, and she looked up at the Oklahoma farmer looming over her and she looked up with trepidation and he said somewhat sternly to her, uh, what are the three most important words in the English language? And she, with some slight fear, uh, said, I, I don't know, what are they? And he said, with uh, shame and some kindness, I was wrong. The quotation is from John Stuart Mill, writing a long time ago. It is hardly possible to overstate the value in the present state of human improvement of placing people in contact with others different from themselves and in contact with ways of thought and action like those with which they are familiar. Such communication has, has always been and is peculiarly in the present age, the primary source of progress. In this uh, valuable and uh, almost everywhere surely valid talk, uh, I find uh, um, 
a large number of cases to which I think I have something to add. Um, the polarizing mm -hmm. e experiments and others uh, involving tendency to move away from the center when one has a chance to deliberate without uh, the, uh, the um, uh, correction of uh, confrontation. And what I'd like to add is that they imply a center. They're, they're in the three panel judges, they were all people who could be appointed by a president in the last 40 years to sit on the bench. And uh, I suggest that uh, in considering these matters, it's important to remember that the center varies spectacularly from decade to decade, and especially from century to century, and also from country to country. Okay, it's, it's a great point. And uh, the fact that deliberating groups typically end up in a more extreme position in line with their pre-deliberation tendencies could be a wonderful thing if the center is lousy. <laughs> so uh, I have a friend who helped break down the Soviet Union. He's from Poland. And he said this wouldn't have been possible without the fact that we were sorted, we anti-communists, into a little echo chamber where we could charge each other up. So the, the fall of apartheid in South Africa, no question. It had to do with people's ability to self-sort. Uh, so, so one thought might be that uh, the movement away from the center is under certain circumstances highly desirable. And the social influences to which I've referred are indispensable for ensuring that that movement occurs. The only cautionary note I'd add is that if these people are polarizing, even if they're um, freedom fighters, it's very important that they encounter at one or another time uh, the alternative view. So even if they represent which from what is from the correct point of view the center, that is, they're where the, 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 the right valued center lies, they, they ought to have to think a little bit about the people who occupy the current center. I'll give you an example uh, that might make that point plausible, which is ask yourself a little bit, where does terrorism come from? Are, are terrorists insane? Actually, the study suggests very few of them are insane. Are they poor? Not really. Are they poorly educated? Actually, they're well above the median education level in their places. Um, do they have certain forms of deprivation that could account for what they do? Not easy to find any. What terrorism seems to be fueled by is polarization, where social networks are created in which people who along various dimensions aren't that unusual talk with like-minded others, and that's what leads people from, let's say, a sense of uh, injustice and deprivation in some sense to a willingness co to confront acts of atrocity. So the idea is that a reality check in the sense of encounter of di with diverse views is very important for those who are both on the right and the wrong side of history. Sir. I have two, br I have two brief questions. The first one is to follow up on the one you just answered, and that is when you have two groups and somebody wishes to stand out, you mentioned that a conservative person will get more conservative or a person in a liberal group will get more radical. Well, why don't they try to stand out by drifting towards the center? And then the second question is, when you mentioned uh, the right to assemble in the streets or parks, uh, how does that square with uh, the right of police to uh, conduct or to say that it's an unlawful assembly? And is this a federal or is this just uh, a state right? Okay, the, the right, the pub, thank you for that. The public forum right is a federal constitutional right, and it means that the streets and parks have to be open for expressive activity. Um, it's not the case that at three in the morning, uh, we can sing very loud songs on the local street. 
nor is it the case that we can obstruct traffic or, um, or uh, cause a disturbance. So there are time, place, and manner restrictions on the federal constitutional right, and they're significant, but the, the right is itself even more significant that if the streets and parks are closed off from expressive activity, which is peaceful, non-disruptive, not noisy, not at three in the morning when Bob Dylan and Britney Spears maybe ought not to be played especially loud, then, uh, the, the, then, the, then the right prevails. On the, the two groups and people standing out, this is, this is a, a great question, and it's a, a little more complicated than my presentation suggested. What I focus on is an architecture of control by which people sort themselves into groups of like-minded types. And uh, some of the uh, ugliest and sometimes literally destructive events of the last 30 years have a lot to do with that. But there's a question, what happens when you have mixing, which didn't occur in, in the two experiments I discussed. I was talking about Bush, Bush, Reagan, and Clinton, Clinton, Carter groups. But what you see on the federal courts is uh, a partial answer. The Republican appointees, when they're with two Democratic appointees, show pretty liberal voting patterns but not as liberal as the two Democratic appointees when they're sitting with one Republican appointee. So Republican appointees show significant movement to the left when they're with two Democratic appointees, perfectly symmetrical. So too, we would expect in any mixed group, the conservatives typically will move a bit if the liberals are there, and the liberals too. Now, there's one account in accordance with which this isn't thrilling if one or another group is just right. But typically, this is, this is the kind of movement we'll observe. There are two qualifications. One is, if the liberals and conservatives greatly distrust each other, if they're kind of frozen and not listening, then you won't see such movement. And there's one court of appeals where the, the statistics I've described just don't show up. The United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, the Ds aren't influenced by the Rs, the Rs aren't influenced by the Ds, and by common lore, they just really distrust one another. And that's what the data tends to show. Uh, so mixing typically involves a degree of movement on both parts. You might ask yourself then a large question, if we got the Boulder people and the Colorado Springs people together, what would happen? One possibility is the Boulder people would just huddle, and so would the Colorado Springs people, and no one would move. Another possibility, which is, is more usual, is that we'd have to ask that mixed group will have a pre-deliberation tendency. Maybe it's relatively climate-concerned Colorado Spring people and very climate-concerned Boulder people, in which case they're going to move to the left. Or maybe it's Boulder people who are nervous about affirmative action and Colorado Springs people hate affirmative action, and they're going to move to the right. So typically, the pre-deliberation tendency is the best predictor, and that works in mixed groups as in like-minded groups. Sir. Thank you. Well, I was wondering, I, I think you've illustrated several examples by which you've demonstrated a lower limit and a number of people in these groups, such as a three-person court of appeals, or the humanizing effects on two people in the farmer in Oklahoma and the New York welfare mother. And I was wondering, is there also an upper limit to these groups by which beyond a certain number, the group becomes too unwieldy, and then the countervailing opinion becomes more dominant? And there's a recent essay that tests some related questions. And the last sentence of the essay is, clearly more research funding is needed. <laughs> uh, I think the authors actually got to publish that last sentence. Uh, th that's a, a really good point. Uh, uh, here's, here's a speculation, that even if the group is very large and unwieldy, the movement thus described will occur. Uh, 
Um, an example, maybe a slightly unfair example, is the Bush administration on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The Bush administration is not little, and yet the, the administration moved to the belief that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in a way that at least plausibly replicates some of our experiments, where the internal disagreement, and there was some, was squelched, not by top down, but by self-squelching, thinking, oh, everyone else thinks the other. And where the, uh, the, the commitment to the belief intensified. Or think of nations which move very dramatically, whole nations we're speaking about, in one or another direction. Now, of course, not, it's not rarely going to be unanimous, but you can see group polarization at the national level, can't you? And maybe you can think of your preferred examples over the last years. One which didn't involve whole nations, but did involve large, unwieldy groups, uh, this is receding from memory a little bit, but the Bush-Gore fight of 2000 involved group polarization both among Bush supporters and among Gore supporters where there was such confidence and clarity about the proper outcome of some technical constitutional issues. And they, it was big, it was large populations. So the speculation is, if you look at the arc of human history, you can often see very large polarization, at least for a short time. Sometimes heterogeneity will reappear as people are all talking to one another. And, and as I'm taking suggested by the question about the center, sometimes th such polarization occurs is highly desirable. The United States polarized in the sense of becoming very broadly committed to a civil rights act in 1964, when uh, that was very divisive stuff in 1954, or impossible stuff. How did that happen? It's partly like-minded people were talking to one another and stirring each other up. The environmental movement has similar features. So a thought is that the dynamics described, if you look to how corroboration increases confidence and that increases extremism, information exchange, and uh, people's concern for their reputation and self-presentation, it can occur among large groups. I mean, a, a grim example, one of history's most grim, is the rise of Nazism. There are some who think that the Germans who were implicated in Nazism, there was something identifiably different from them, from other human beings. It's worth wondering whether that's plausible or whether instead there wasn't a kind of large-scale cultural movement in which people who really weren't different were in little polarization machines. I'll give you one, one more example. Uh, Yugo, the former Yugoslavia was a place that involved very little ethnic strife, uh, racial intermarriage, um, uh, mutual interactions and interests, very little ethnic identification. And then in a fairly short period, things just split. And people, mar mixed marriages broke up. People who formerly didn't think of themselves in ethnic terms started being extremely identified. That's large, large groups. And there was one account that primordial angers and old buried ethnic antagonisms had finally bubbled to the surface. A competing account is there are, there's nothing primordial about ethnic identifications. It's not in the blood. It doesn't bubble up. It's that there was a series of social pressures which created some polarization machines. And we can think of educational systems, you know, you can think of your least favorite university, which maybe has that function, not in that vicious kind of way, but some. So. Uh, oh, oh. Okay, thank you, thank you all. Thank you.